אוניברסיטה שנמצאת אי שם בנגב, אתם uh, לא צריכים להכיר אותה במיוחד, אין שום סיבה. Uh, ביקשו ממני קצת לדבר על... Uh, אנחנו נדבר קצת על uh, מחלות, או על גישה מסוימת למחלות של המוח. אני מבין ש... Uh, אתם לא אנשי מדעי החיים בהכרח, נכון? זה נכון? בהכרח לא, בהכרח לא. בהכרח לא. אז אני אראה את זה בתור פתיחה. אני מקווה שהשיעור לא יישמע בדיוק ככה, אבל אני לא יודע אם אתם מכירים את זה. זה מחובר נכון למגמה? אתם שומעים משהו? זה לא מחובר למערכת ההגברה הזאת, אה? אה. טוב, אני מצטער שלא שמעתם, אבל זה שלא הבנתם, זה לא באשמתכם כמובן. אני מקווה שהשיעור יהיה קצת יותר ברור. כשמדברים על המוח, בדרך כלל, אולי בסוף השיעור אנחנו נשמע את זה עוד פעם עם המערכת ההגברה של הכיתה, אז נראה אם החכמתם. כשאנחנו מדברים על המוח, אנחנו בדרך כלל מדברים על תאי עצב כאיזשהו principal cells, כ... אגב, עברית זה בסדר? או... מה? אה, סליחה, אוקיי. זהו, כי פתאום נזכרתי שאולי... אוקיי. So, when we talk about, when we are talking about the central nervous system, about the brain, usually... What we are talking about is neurons. Neurons are the principal cells of the central nervous system. This is a picture that uh, Ramon Icajal, Ramon Icajal was a, a Spanish anatomist. He was a great uh, drawer. He was an artist, actually. He looked under the microscope. There were no cameras at the time, and he just drew what he saw. And he, of course, drew beautiful pictures. Many of, of these uh, neurons, he actually, from what he could see, he predicted a lot of things that we know today about the brain, but he mainly had talked about neurons, nerve cells. And you probably heard and you know that nerve cells are the principal cells. So if a nerve cell fires action potentials, he fires pa 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 pam and if it's the, the right nerve cell at the motor cortex, at my motor cortex, I will do pa 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 I will contract my muscle and do something. And when we are talking about diseases of the brain, usually people were looking for the last 50 years or more to look what's, what, what's the problem with neurons? What's the problem with these cells? Why they don't function as they should? But in the recent years, we started to think a little bit about differently about the system. And perhaps one way to look at it is to think 
uh, let's suppose that we are coming from another planet. Let's suppose we are coming from Mars or from some, someplace else. And we have no idea about what's, what's going on in this place. So we are coming looking from above and we are looking at this crazy event. And we would like to investigate, we would like to search, to make research about the rules and how this thing function. So then, you know, one as a researcher from Mars will ask himself, what should I investigate? What should I study? Should I study the most common unit in this, in this network, in this structure? Shall I look at the structure? Shall I draw each unit of this structure? Shall I look at the different shape? Shall I look at the different voices that they do? <laughs> or would, would that lead me to the principles and to the rules of the game? Or perhaps another researcher will say, well, you know, they have there's so many of them, but there could be that there are some units in this function in, in this structure that are more important than the others. And I probably should focus on some principle or some specific units in this network. And in a way, if you think about it, this is what we are doing about the brain. I mean, we have no idea, basically, how it works. And we are starting to fish and to look at things that we think maybe they are more common and maybe they are more important, maybe not. And actually, the truth is that to understand a football game, to really understand the phenomena, and I'm not necessarily applying this as a pathological phenomena, but if we are trying to understand it, we, we, we can really think that there are some interactions between the different parts of the network. So none of the, of the individual parts cells, structures in the network would act the same if it was used to be alone, if it would be alone. So to understand this cultural and phenomena, we really have to understand not only how each unit is working, is functioning, but how they interact with each other. And if we go back to the brain, we actually should uh, realize that uh, maybe we should put this a little bit darker, the room, okay. uh, that most of the brain is actually that most of our brain is actually blood vessels. So from principal cells and neurons, now when we are looking inside the brain, we have infinite number, huge number of structure that are blood vessels. And this is not the whole thing. So we have blood vessels, we have cells, we have different cells, and today we would like to think about the functional unit of the brain is not as nerve cells, not, a, not even a network of nerve cells, but a neurovascular unit. So this is now the INI term, I should say, the most popular term now in, in or becoming in, in, in neuroscience and especially when we're talking about diseases. And one thing that you can realize, and this, uh, that this, this neurovascular unit is a functional unit that involves many different cells many different types of cells. It involves the vessels of the brain, and I will talk about them a little bit later, about supporting cells, glia cells, that people used to say that they are glued, the glue, glia cells is coming from the world, glue, that they glue the brain together, to like give the structure of the brain, but of course they have much more important a function today, and these are called astrocytes, or glia cells. We have principal neurons, we have interneurons, so neurons that are not sending information outside, but are inside the network. We have immune cells that 
probably are not only functioning in disease states, but, but, but they do a lot, of course, change their functions during disease. And all of them together working, are working as a unit, are kind of interacting with each other, are affecting each other, are influencing each other to preserve the, the normal function of the brain and, to, uh, and other diseases. And one very interesting thing to note when you're looking at this picture, actually, of, the, of this uh, so I don't know how, how much you can see, but these are, these are uh, capillaries within the brain. And the blue is a dappy staining for cells. And one thing you can see, I hope, that in principle, each cell is supplied by its own capillary. Each cell has its own blood supply. That's one principle, one important thing. The other important thing is that the distance between cells and vessels is very, very small. So if we are looking, if we are really measuring it, the distance between the microvessel and the neuron is 20 microns, 20 micrometers which suggests that they really can interact and influence each other. And we'll see how later on. And the second characteristic of, uh, or the third characteristic of this, of this enriched blood supply to the brain can be seen in this picture. So one, one thing, of course, is that there's really lots of blood supply. And the second is the red color, which stains proteins in the, in, the, in the blood. And I think it's pretty clear that the blood vessels are very much separated from the brain. And this is another characteristic that is very uh, important and very different than brain from any other structure, every, any other structure in, in our body. So I don't know how much biology you learned, but in our body, usually capillaries are these small, tiny blood vessels are fenestrated. They are fenestrated, they are open. Actually, there is transfer, transfer almost free transfer of uh, electrolytes, water, even small proteins from the blood into the tissue all over our body. But in the brain, it's a completely different story. And Paul Ehrlich, the guy, this uh, scientist, uh, this uh, Jewish Berliner uh, doctor, he was sitting at the, in Berlin uh, the beginning of the 20th century, and he actually was doing experiment and watching. It was a good time. They just watched and tried to, under tried to understand. And he injected dyes into the blood, and he found out that all the, the, the whole body is stained by the, these dyes, except the brain and spinal cord. And he actually was thinking, so what could be the possibilities? So you have, you inject a dye, it goes everywhere, but it doesn't go to the brain. So basically, there are two possibilities. So what a researcher could think of? What could be the explanation? So, the, the, so one thing is that it doesn't cross, which will be the trivial one. But there is a more sophisticated one, and of course he was a sophisticated scientist, so he said, well, it crosses, but the brain expel it out. The brain actually put out the dye from the brain back to the, to the blood. And that's what his interpretation, actually. His student, was named, his name was uh, Goldman, another Jew. Uh, he wanted to confirm or to probably prove that his boss was uh, wrong. So what did he do? How could you differentiate between the two options if there is a barrier of, or whether the... Inject into the brain. And that's what he did. And, and it didn't cross. It stayed in the brain. So he, of course, ruled out the explanation of his boss and he confirmed that there is a barrier. So the vessels... Uh, are protected by what we know today, the blood-brain barrier. And you know this, 
the first time I heard this term actually was in the surgery room. The, that's the definition of the anesthesiologist. You know, between the anesthesiologist that's sitting on the head of the patient and the, and the surgeon, there is a sardin yarok. There's a shit, green shit. So the anesthesiologist call it the blood-brain barrier. But, uh, uh, but uh, the thing in uh, uh, the term that we use it usually is this, this barrier that engulf uh, blood vessels. Um, and we know much, much about it, so I will not go into details. This is not the time, but just to uh, let you know that this is not a virtual thing. We know much about the structure of this barrier. We know that there are many proteins there. There are kind of proteins that hold each other between blood vessels. This is the uniqueness of this uh, barrier. Uh, so we call it tight junction proteins. The proteins between the endothelial cells, they are uh, astrocytes. So these glia cells that are surrounding the vessels, and these glia cells are uh, surrounding the vessels and, and serve as another protective mechanism. They are pericytes. There are all kinds of mechanisms just to protect the environment of the brain. And probably it's very important to protect the small distance that we have between the brain. This is 20, 30 micrometers of extracellular space between the cells and the blood just to protect them uh, from the blood. So why, so what, is, what do we have to protect? That, that is basically the question. And an observation that many people did in the literature is that in many, 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 many diseases of the central nervous system, basically in any disease that you are, if you look at the literature, there is dysfunction of this barrier. So if you look at head trauma, if you look at stroke, ischemic stroke, if you look at epilepsy, if you look at Parkinson, if you look at Alzheimer's disease, uh, you know, pain, just name it. There are reports, at least reports, multiple sclerosis and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, by the way, feel free to stop me and ask questions. The other base, uh, very interesting observation when we are looking at the dysfunction of neurons, when we are talking about diseases, is that the most common diseases of the brain are vascular diseases. So in a way, there is some kind of... Um, doesn't make much sense, you know, most of the diseases are diseases of the, of the vessels and we were for, for years looking what's happening to neurons. So this is, so stroke, cerebrovascular injuries are the most common actually uh, um, disease of the brain. It's number two or three cause of death, so many of us will die uh, because of stroke. Uh, of course it's a, it's a huge uh, cause for disability, especially in old population, but not only. And 80% of them are caused by ischemia, which means that there is lack of oxygen to the tissue, or there is not enough oxygen compared to the metabolic demand, and usually it is due to blockade of uh, vessels. There is no open space, actually. So, uh, so first of all, 20 microns is not much. And there are proteins there that are uh, coming from the brain. And the 20 microns that I show you is actually the distance to the nucleus, so there's the cytoplasm. And basically, there's hardly any space. So the space is really cells are, so if you're looking at the vessel, the vessel is surrounded by endothelial cells. And then it's surrounded by the associatic end fit, which is another endothelial cells and the membrane, and parasites, and microglia there, and then neurons. And basically, they are all sticky and almost touch each other. So um, the extracellular space is very, very tiny. Some yeah, sure. Of the, of the barrier when it opens? Well, I'll get to it at the end. Uh, not at the moment. That, that's one of the main problems that we don't know how to control this barrier, but this is actually the, the, the challenge. But first, we would like to see whether it's really important and why it is important. 
So that would be the first step to prove or to confirm that it's important. Then the question why it is important. So that would be, so what happened when it's dysfunctional and why? And once we know that, we can either correct the barrier or correct the mechanism that it disturbs. Right. Uh, so indeed, 80% of, of uh, the ischemic stroke are actually due to, plug, to plugged vessels, to thrombi, to clot within the vessels. 20% are due to hemorrhages. So hemorrhages are relatively less common. And then there's always a question, there are so many stroke patients, and what are we really, how are we really, can really uh, want to treat them? And what is really the problem of stroke patients? And one, uh, one thing probably you heard in the past, that if you stop the blood supply to the brain, how long does it take to uh, nerve cells to die? Not that short. But few minutes, few minutes. How many few? Hmm? About yeah, six to eight minutes. Nerve cells that don't get blood supply are dying. And nevertheless, you will read every once in a while in the paper, and you know that the, you know countries, the government, the National Institute of Health in the United States invest billions in trying to treat stroke patients. So then you ask yourself, what's the logic? I mean, what's the chance that I can treat a stroke patient in seven minutes? I mean, is there any chance that he will ever get to the hospital in eight minutes? The answer is no. There's not even chance that I will get to him. So why should we invest billions to treat them? And the answer is, of course, that it's not that simple. That many of the stroke patients get to the hospital with a slight weakness of hand or uh, foot or face, a problem of talking, and many of them improve during the weeks and months after that, or even during the days after that. So if they improve, it means that the, whole, that the brain didn't die, really. So that's one, one, one point. And many of these patients die or suffer from complications. So many of them deteriorate during the next days and weeks and months after the event. And this is really the main question. Why some of them improve and why some of them deteriorate? Some of them, for example, develop hemorrhage. So we, I said that 20, only 20% are hemorrhage, but some of the stroke patients, the ischemic stroke, will turn into a hemorrhagic one, will bleed. Ma? Ariel Sharon is a, who is Ariel Sharon? Ariel Sharon is, a, is an interesting example of how physicians can induce hemorrhagic stroke. That's true, right? Because he, he was suffering actually from ischemic stroke or a mild ischemic stroke what they call transit, so he improved, he had symptoms, he improved. So the doctors said probably he has a clot, or threatening clot, then what did they give him? They gave him anticoagulants. So he, they gave him medications against the clotting system. Now he was a very important man, so he was, you know, he was the prime minister. So you don't play with the prime minister, you give him a lot of anticoagulants. You know, every doctor that he went probably gave him a little bit, you know. So he got a lot of anticoagulants. So what happened to him? He made, he developed hemorrhagic, a uh, hemorrhage into his brain and that was, uh, and he's still uh, alive, by the way. Everybody in the hospital started to get Klexan after they were shown. Everybody was very smart. Yeah, yeah, correct. So he got Plexan, but he also got aspirin, and I think he also got Comodin. So he got three uh, uh, medications at the same time. He got extra treatment because it was so important, probably that would kill him also. But some of the patients develop epilepsy. 
So you probably heard about epilepsy as disease of, of young kids, but actually epilepsy, the highest incidence of epilepsy is at the adult and the old population. So we all still have a chance to develop seizures and epilepsy when we are old. Some of the stroke patients, as I said, improve, but some of them really deteriorate cognitively. They lose function with, with the years. And then they become debilitated, they become dependent, and they need help, and so on and so on. And some of them have uh, mental illnesses, including depression, is a very, very common finding in stroke patients. So basically, in a way, we are trying to fight, when we are trying to think of stroke, we are not really, or we should at least, not only think of saving the neurons, these neurons that die, or if they died, they died, but really to try to understand how and why some people rehabilitate and improve, and some people deteriorate and uh, even die. And of course, one way to understand stroke is to use animal experiments. And this is always uh, a big question, what we can really learn from animal experiments. I hope, uh, I don't know what you think about it, but we will, uh, at least I show you how we uh, can look at it in the lab. And uh, one way to do it, at least to learn about it, one way that to do it is to induce a thrombus, to induce a clot within a blood vessel. And uh, one way to do it is to inject into the blood uh, um, an innocent chemical that you, but when you put light on it, a green laser, it induces damage to the endothelial cells. The chemical actually change its, its structure and induce a clot. And I'll show you in the next video how a clot is generated. So we can learn, we can a little bit see how it, how it works. So this is the blood vessels. Here we inject the dye and we put a laser and then it start, a clot is, you can already see in the small blood vessels that there is a blood clot. I hope you can see here that the blood clot is generated often in bifurcation, in areas of bifurcation. And not so slowly, actually. This is within seconds. You have, so the, the clotting system is one of the, one of the examples that we, uh, that we always uh, tell students about a positive feedback mechanism. When you have a clot, there is a generation of more clot, of more clot, of more clot, just to plug, and the vessels are eventually completely plugged. No blood is uh, perfused through these vessels, and of course, no blood supply. There will be death of cells. And in this area, in this small area, no neurons will survive. So within a few minutes, as we said, there will be nothing there. And there's not, not much we can do about it anyway. So this is not the interesting thing, the really interesting thing. What is really interesting, perhaps, so if right now we are doing, now we zoom out. So this is the control experiment. You see the blood supply, the arterial supply, now the venous drainage. And here in the other uh, image, I hope you saw, show it again. Between veins and arteries and veins. Don't you know that? Okay, so you, this is very easy. First, there is a fill. If you inject, first there's a fill in the artery, and then the second phase, there is a drainage, there's the venous drainage. So the blood is first goes to the arteries and then goes to the veins. But if you look again, now look at the treated, uh, so now we inject again. You can see that the blood gets to here. It stopped here. Here there is a blood supply maintained. Here there will be a stroke. So what is really Im interesting here, actually, it's what's, what's going in the surrounding of the stroke, not, not actually in the center. And it has been 
we know it from, for a while, for, for several years, that, that surrounding the stroke, there's an area of the brain that we call it the penumbra. It's an area that is kind of area in risk. This is the area of the brain that is still maintained blood supply. There is still perfusion of blood. But it can deteriorate. It can either progress into cell death or recover and become functional. And this area, this penumbra, it's the area that's surrounding the focus, the ischemic center, is the, is the, place, that, is the, is the place that we're fighting on. Okay? So we are not actually fighting the focus of the stroke, the stroke area, but we rather trying to understand what's happening in the penumbra surrounding the stroke. And very soon after a stroke develops in the penumbra, we can see two, two types of abnormal activities that I will briefly uh, show you. One abnormal activity is called status epilepticus, and another one is spreading the polarizations, and I will try to uh, show you the difference between them. Status epilepticus, anybody, anyone knows? Refractory status of uh, epilepsia that uh, doesn't respond to medication. Uh, right, it can respond, but at least it lasts for a while. So it's a seizure, it's electrical seizure, that doesn't stop immediately, or not within minutes. So it's prolonged seizure. This is how it looks in animal. Just to uh, this, you'll see here a mice, I think, if I remember correctly. This is a mice injected um, that will soon will have a, a status. This is recording from its brain. This is basically the normal activity. The, ni the mice, you can see, is pretty much. And suddenly, they're becoming a high amplitude activity. And this is actually what we're trying to understand. And slowly, slowly, there is kind of developing of a seizure. This is a short seizure. This seizure stopped. So this was a short seizure. But now, see the tail, and this seizure develops. And now there is actually a lasting seizure that will become status epilepticus that can actually kill the animal. And you can see here that there's involuntary movements of the tail, of the head, and soon the animal will basically, the animal basically now is unconscious. And, and that can last for minutes and sometimes even hours after stroke. And of course, this brain area on this animal become dysfunctional. Hmm? Yeah, this is difficult. This is uh, not easy. It's always interesting that when you uh, show, usually actually I show first the animal, the um, seizure in, uh, in humans, so how a seizure looks like in a, in a patient and then the mice, and always people more care about the mice actually, right? I mean, it is much more difficult to see than how somehow. Because you caused it or not? Yeah, maybe. Because you didn't cause it. Well, that's, we can debate, we can argue on that, but yeah. But somehow. <laughs> <laughs> So even, by the way, even if it's not induced, so the epilepsy actually is a genetic disease and you have mice that are genetically epileptic. Even then, for many people, it's harder to see animals uh, than to see humans. I don't know why, but it's, uh, this is induced. This is induced. Yeah, this is, but, yeah. And the animal doesn't suffer. Like the humans don't suffer because also a patient doesn't suffer because they lost their conscience. If you ask epileptic patient if he's suffering from the, from the attack itself, usually they don't, know, they, 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 lose the, they don't even remember. They suffer from the, well, how the, envir you know, how the environment looks at them after the, they, they suffer from the fact that they don't know what happened to them. The fact that they found later, they found themselves on the streets or whatever, or they're confused, but they don't suffer from the attack. It's not painful, the brain is not painful. So most of the patients will tell you that 
what bothers them is the fact, well, the fact that they don't function, and the fact what people tell about them, and the, what, how the people treat them, but not the... Where is it in the brain, by the way? Sorry? Where is it in the brain, this, this area? <laughs> These ones that, that we feel empathy, empathy by the way. Empathy. No, I'm no, absolutely not. The, uh, pre, uh, prefrontal cortex. region, right. Prefrontal cortex. This is the area that is very unique to people, right? That we feel empathy. And uh, this is why we, yeah, we have doctors and social workers and, and the animals don't. So it's very unique to people. You can work for very little money. And, uh, and Both social, work, social workers and, uh, but and that's why we have, um, yeah, that's why we have people in the treasury that don't have prefrontal cortex, so don't they care about us, right? <laughs> and the other, uh, um, yeah. <coughs> and so, so what you saw there is, 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 is seizure. So seizure is in, uh, hypersynchronous activity, so groups, large groups of cells fire together in the penumbra and they start a fire action potentials, these fast events uh, which can propagate. So that the fact that you saw it first in the tail and then it went to the, to the rest of the body of the animal, it means that it propagates along the cortex. And if it lasts for a long time of period, it can induce damage, secondary damage from reasons that we will uh, can discuss later on. And the second event is what we call spreading depolarization. So depolarization is the fact that these uh, cells are changing the membrane potential. So they, they lose the membrane potential. This is the brain, you can see here the hippocampus. And surrounding the infarct, there's a wave of depolarization, again, that spreads very slowly. This is what's happened also with people with migraine attack. Probably, that's what you think today. So people with migraine attack, especially those with migraine aura, you know these people that they suffer from, especially in families when they have, a, starting with a loss of vision in one side, or they see some th strange stars, or in basically they lose, they lose their vision during their attack or before the migraine attack, and it spreads and they lose, uh, slowly they lose their vision, sometimes even uh, uh, transient hemi um, weakness. So it's a spread of, a, it's a wave of depolarization. So once the cells are depolarized, they lose the membrane potential, they cannot fire action potential, they cannot basically do their function, the normal function. And this wave also is generated in the penumbra. And it's, uh, so these two kinds of pathological activities are very different from each other, but are both of them happens in the surrounding of the stroke. One of them is the seizures, so these are the action potentials that you can see here. This is an EG of a patient. So you can see that a localized action potential is fast activity, unlike the slow depolarization. Uh, but both of them basically means that this part of the brain doesn't function anymore. And both events lead to changes in the vascular. So we were talking about interactions between neurons and vessels. So we will see how they can interact with each other. And both of them can lead to further damage of nerve cells, death of nerve cells, and so on. And of course, the question would be, what is their common mechanism? And before we get to that, one thing that we certainly know is that there are interactions between the activity of nerve cells and vascular response. How is it called? Anybody knows? This is the, we call it neurovascular coupling. Simud neurovasculare. What is it? Anybody knows? How do we use it in research? How psychologists use it for research? Any psychologist here? FMRI, right, functional MRI. 
צריך להסביר או שיודעים? Functional MRI is the fact that you can put someone into the MRI. You tell him to move your hand. And once he moves his hand, you see a change in signal in his motor cortex, contralateral to the hand that he moved. Actually, he will not only see it in the motor cortex, because if you told him, move your hand, you'll also see it in the auditory cortex, because you told him, so he heard you. He wanted to move his hand, so there will be pre-motor activation and motor activation. Okay? And sensory also, because actually you feel that you do it. And you can also do neat, uh, you know, neat experiments. You can tell someone, uh, you know, think about your grandmother, and you'll see his grandmother area, and so on and so forth. So you can do everything, all kinds of nice psychological experiments. People are doing it today to see what areas in the brain you activate when you see advertisements, when you see, when you uh, perform economical decisions, how emotions affect economical decisions, and so on. So you can really see areas in the brain that are activated. Or at least we believe that we see areas that are activated. We would like to think that we see these areas. And the principle of fMRI is very simple. So you don't see, fMRI doesn't record activity, brain activity. But in fMRI, you measure the signal. And actually, what you measure is the ratio between oxygen, oxygenated hemoglobin, and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And what happens is when you activate a brain area, the increased metabolic demand of the cells induce increased blood flow to the same area. So vessels dilate, and there is increase in blood flow to the same area. So once that happened, there is more oxygenated hemoglobin coming to this area, and there's that, that why there is more oxygenated than deoxygenated hemoglobin. So, uh, so this is this neurovascular coupling, the coupling between nerve activity to the vasodilatation of the capillaries. It's probably mediated via these glia cells. And this is a recording that was done by a group in Germany in a human brain after a hemorrhage. And so we're not only doing it to animals, also to humans. Uh, in, this cases, in these cases, the patients were operated, so that was a good excuse to put electrodes inside the brain. And the electrodes could measure both activity of neurons and blood flow. Okay? And what you can see here that at some point in this electrode, there was a slow event which we called spreading depolarization. And the blood flow indeed was increased. So this is neurovascular coupling. So there is increased activity, there was depolarization, increased demand of metabolic demand, okay, and increased blood flow. So that is the normal and these patients actually survived and improved. But interestingly, in some patients, or not in so few, but in, in many patients, you have this spreading depolarization or even seizures, and there was actually decrease in blood flow. So what was abnormal coupling on, there was inverse, what we call inverse coupling. And these patients, despite the fact that they have meta increased metabolic demand, they had decreased blood flow and damage to their uh, and, and damage to the brain. So this is how they summarized their finding recently. Uh, there was, in some cases, this abnormal pathological activity with increased blood flow, and these patients made it well. And in some cases, the same was longer, and it was ischemia actually, spreading ischemia and inverse coupling in these patients. And what is very, very uh,
typical in this penumbra area, where we have also these events, these electrical events, that we see this, this is the Paul Ehrlich experiment that we, we started uh, our, started the, the lecture with, and I told you that when you inject the blue dye into the blood, it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. But what you can see here, that in the penumbra, you have increased permeability of these blood vessels, and basically you lose the integrity of the barrier. So this is a typical event, vascular event. That's cool. That's cool. That's a, that's a typical event that you see, a vascular change that you see. Um, you see it in patients and you see it in animals, so this is very similar in both models of the disease. And you can see here, this, all this blue area are areas that cells didn't die, not, in the, not initially at least. It's surrounding the stroke, but the vessels change. Partly probably because of seizures, of this abnormal electrical activity, because of the spreading depolarization, but the blood and barrier is disrupted in the stroke patient. So this is how it looks. So this is an experiment, this is the surface of the brain. It's a little bit blue because Evans blue was injected. Now we induce a thrombus. So here there's decreased blood supply. And you remember that happened within seconds. Now look at the clock here. Now it's the time is one hour, two hours soon, three hours and so on. And within hours you have a development of this penumbra of damage to blood vessels probably because all kinds of reasons that we don't really understand, but, but you have a development of this penumbra with leakage of, leakage of proteins from the blood into the brain. And the question, of course, is, uh, is it important? So, as I showed you before, in many, many diseases of the nervous system, you have leakage of these blood vessels. You, have lose, you, you lose the integrity of the blood and barrier. And the question, the main question, whether it's relevant to the outcome of the patients, and whether it's associated with the outcome of the penumbra, whether it's associated with dysfunction of the nervous system in this area, whether it's associated with network plasticity, and why plasticity is associated here? Any idea? Why plasticity? Why we need, do we need plasticity around the stroke area? Do we have plasticity around the stroke? Hmm? So do, is it, does it happen? Does it happen? Hmm? Not really? Is there any evidence for... So first of all, plasticity in the nervous system is where the nervous system can change, right? It's plastic, can get new functions with time and with experience, right? Can it happen in the adult? Is there plasticity in the adult? Yes. Yes. What's the evidence for that? Hmm? Right, so talking about several things. So one thing, one point that you made is that there are new neurons generated in the adult mice or human. Is that true? Yes, that seems to be true. Okay, so the whole, the old story that on, hmm? Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's we know. Is that, does that necessarily mean plasticity? 
Okay, so let's define plasticity. So what do we mean by plasticity in the brain? And then we decide whether it means plasticity or not. So how would we define plasticity within our brain? Do we have plasticity in, in the adult brain? Do we have, each of us, the capability to change his brain? Well, hopefully, yes, right? Yeah, can you give me an example? Right. Every time we learn, we have change, we must have a change in the brain. Does it mean that we have new neurons? Or does it mean that new neurons are important for that? Necessary for that? Probably not, right? And new neurons are probably generated in very specific brain regions, while plasticity is overall, all over. So what is plasticity? Then? Right. Yes, how that happens, or at least what is the dogma? How do we think it happens? Right, but new interactions between neurons, right? By strengthening existing connective connections or creating new connectivity connections. Okay, so every time we learn something, there's a new connection which is not necessarily, at least functionally, there is a new connection. That's at least how we see it. Okay? So it means that all of us have this capability of plasticity. So that's one very clear point. But is it limited? Of course it's limited. And can we, for example, can we, can we take the area of the hand in our motor cortex and change it into, and change it? Is there evidence for that? So can we, we have an area, can we change the connectivity, for example, in a very simple network in our brain, like the motor hand area? Can we do that? Mm -hmm. hmm? How? Like very much play in drums and uh, coordination and improve. Yeah, well, there's a, that's true that we can change coordination. Is, is it uh, necessarily in the motor cortex? That's not that clear because there are other brain regions that can happen, right? For example, where? Where do we learn coordination? Cerebellum is very important for that. The, the cerebellum in the back of our brain is and very important for that. Yeah, is the plasticity in the corpus callosum? I don't know. Probably not, no, right? Because this not. is a bundle of axons. So probably not. Uh, but probably, I agree. Well, we have some evidence. For example, if we tie our, if we will not use one of our hands, we will lose also, we will lose our capabilities. So it means that it can also change both directions. And that's probably true. Can a hand region become a leg region? So if we have a stroke in our hand region, can another region take its place? So can entirely different connectivity, can, can that happen? Can plasticity go so far? You see what I mean? Well, there are cases where people without hands use their legs as if they're their hands and they're doing some meeting and stuff like that. Who are these, can you? Tell us, uh, which, which example do you know? Uh, I don't know my name, but I've seen uh, testimonies in, uh, in videos and in uh, movies, news. What, that was, was the case? What, what happened there? Ah, they were born without hands. Okay, they were born without, okay, which is an important okay. issue. Okay, so, so until a certain age, probably it's true. Right, but that's usually the case when you're born without being able to use your hand. Should not have any At what age? So if 
let's say if you know the story about this, uh, what was the name of this? Uh, uh, no, 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 but it was the name of this uh, kid that was grown in the jungle, Erkarula Mowgli. Mowgli. So there are cases of Mowgli, right? There are cases of kids that were, grew up without any uh, contact to people. Can they learn to speak later on in life? Hmm? Certain, age. Certain age. Which age? Right. Right, something like that. Mm -hmm. 11, 12. Same right. So some plasticity is very much age, critically depending by age. So if there are studies, for example, on blind people that are, don't use the visual cortex, and if it happens from birth, they can use the visual cortex for other tasks especially for memory. So that's why usually they, they, are, they have a much better memory than people that do see. Much more memory to detail, much more for, for, for voices and so on. Because they can take one part of the brain and use it, really make it completely plastic. Really use it completely for a different task. This becomes more and more limited with age. And probably, uh, and probably when you are adult, you cannot really switch one area of the brain to do a completely different task. But you can improve your left hand if your right hand is, is damaged, for example, is, is hurt. So you can, you can improve an existing area, but you cannot really completely switch uh, one, one area to another. So this is, um, so this is the, the point of plasticity. So there was one a very important question whether uh, vessels permeability is important for that. And of course, neurodegeneration. So neurodegeneration, the losing of cells is also a critical issue. Of course, when we are getting old and especially when we have an insult and this is the deterioration of cognitive capabilities that we have or not have after a stroke. So what will be the experimental strategy? So if you, if you are in a researcher, how will you ask the question? So the question is to remind you, okay? There is a stroke, there is a leakage surrounding the stroke and now we, we ask whether this leakage is anyway critical to any of the uh, potential uh, outcomes of stroke, uh, rehabilitation or deterioration, and what will be the experimental strategy? How will we test this hypothesis or question? What would you do? Theoretically, let's, let's say you could do everything. I mean, forget the technical difficulties at the moment, but let's say you could do everything. Just plan an experiment to answer your question or answer my question. So you, you, you know Koch? Did you hear about Koch? Koch who invented the bacteria, who found that bacteria causes damages. So I think he looked at the microscope and he found little bugs whenever you have an infection. Whenever people are sick and have fever, and the people have fever and they have increased the number of white blood cells and they have uh, some little bugs in their uh, wound or whatever, and he asked himself, how can I prove that these bugs are a cause of disease or unrelated or a result of the disease, or maybe these are the white blood cells? So he had different phenomena there, right? He had increased white blood cells, he had increased 
bugs, number of bugs. He has uh, edema, increased protein, increased platelets, other cells, and he asks himself, basically, how can I prove what is, the what is the cause of the disease and what is the result of the disease? So what did he do? Come. Wake up. <laughs> it's not that difficult. Okay, so one option is to time. This can be very difficult, but this is definitely an option just to observe and see what's first. Right. That is an option. It will still uh, not. Hmm? If they tell the people and the cause something to prevent the next Let's take mice. <laughs> 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 How about mice first before we go into? I know some people that would do it Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so okay, so one option one option is timing. Timing is always uh, difficult because it could have. Uh, so if it happens at the same time, how will you still know? But that's definitely an option. It gives a lot of hints. Just observation, better observation. So we can take patients, for example. Theoretically, let's say we don't have any technical difficulties and look at the blood barrier and see when it opens and when is the outcome. It still will not tell you that it causes, right? It just tells you that it's before. Yeah, exactly. This is a correlation. A correlation doesn't tell you... It's not a causal relationship. Absolutely not. And we have to be very careful about it. It can be unrelated or it can be that this causes something else to cause... The disease. No, but actually, when I take a healthy glucose before, let's say that we take a healthy glucose before. Exactly. And then what we do? What we do? And we induce. And then we take the bacteria again. And you go with them. Right. 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 Right, so Koch said we need two things, basically. We need first to take the bacteria, uh -huh. put it into an animal. He was this one of these strange people that uh, prefer to cause disease to animals. And let's see if the animal develops a disease. That would be one thing. But this is not everything. What would be the other thing? Let's take then the animal and somehow exactly. eradicate the bacteria and see if the animal becomes healthy. Okay? And if we have both ways, then we are pretty certain the bacteria can cause, will cause the disease. Okay? So, now, oh, it's simple, right? So now, we can learn from Koch, and we can try to induce opening of the barrier and see if we get the disease, right? And hopefully, oh, another option is, or oh, the other thing that we have to do, we can use the timing, by the way, but we really need to close the barrier and see if we can prevent the disease, right? Okay, how can we induce the barrier opening? So of course one, one option to do it is to induce a stroke, like I showed you. So we induce a stroke, and then you will induce a barrier opening in the surrounding, and then you can see what's happened to this, to this specific region. But this is of course, a, a, and indeed when you do it, as I showed you, you get seizures, you get status epilepticus, you get spreading repolarization, you get cell death, and so on. But this is, of course, a problematic issue because you also have the thrombus. You also have the infarcted regions. So we need another approach. So what would be the other approach? Is to uh, open the barrier directly. And what can be done is to just to open the barrier with some chemicals without killing anything. 
So basically what you see here is the same uh, what we saw before. So this is the normal brain. You can see that the, this fluorescent dye doesn't cross the barrier. But here you can really see that it goes out of the vessels into the brain. As you can see here, there's no blood clot, there is no stroke, there's no infarction, there's nothing. Okay? And what really happens immediately after or within a few hours that you have edema because proteins are leaking into the, uh, this tiny extracellular space. When proteins goes, water comes after. I won't ask you why, but I hope you figure it out. Okay? So water diffuses after following these proteins and you get edema. That's what we call edema, okay? And then when can uh, uh, take these brains and record from them. And when you can see very clearly that several days after the inducing of the opening, you get these huge, we call it huge, but these are uh, voltage traces. So this is electrical activity. So what you see here is voltage against time. And this is uh, a normal brain in the cortex when you stimulate the cortex. One thing that is very uh, typical to the brain, to our brain, especially to our cerebral cortex, when you activate it, it shuts itself down. Okay? When we have an input into the brain, the brain gets the input and closes it close down and close the response. We need to respond to this input immediately and very for a very short time and stop it. Okay? So we have excitation and inhibition. That's why we have excitation and inhibition in the brain to stop the signal. So this is the normal brain response. The other typical uh, characteristics is that it's very local. So if you stimulate a certain brain region, only this same region is activated. And activity doesn't propagate into the rest of the brain. Because we need to keep basically the same, the same tract. I activate my finger. Once I stop activating, first I want my brain to stop working. And second thing, I want only to the finger area of my brain to activate because I only touch this, this place, of course. So I don't want the rest of the, my brain to be activated. And this is what you see here. So once you stimulate, activation is localized and very brief in time. But after inducing vascular damage, you get this phenomena. So activation is much more prolonged in time. And it propagates, so it's not focal. Okay? And this is, again, animal. This is how it will look in an animal when you have such a propagating activity. So first of all, this area of the brain doesn't function well, and you see the leg of the animal is a little bit up. And when it propagates, this is again an epileptic seizure. The animal is unconscious, and this is an epileptic attack, okay? This is a typical epileptic attack. It starts from one area of the brain and it propagates to the rest of the brain. And that's why in people, we often see it starting with one hand, starting with turning off the head and losing conscious and all uh, two arms and two feet are contracting. So this is a typical epileptic seizure and it's developing due to, only due to this leakage of uh, blood proteins into the brain. Questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, interestingly enough, now we can do all kinds of methods to check what happens to this brain. Uh, Interestingly enough, you don't have much cell loss in this time, time frame, so there is a functional change, there's no structural change, although later on, several weeks later on, you do see 
in neurodegenerative phenomena. So you can see here these cells, these are the normal cells with lots of branches that disconnect with each other. And one month later, you see this degenerated network. So there is degeneration, but it's very slow and it follows the epileptic activity. So this is not uh, inducing the epilepsy. So now, how can you confirm that this is indeed the blood and barrier? So what can you also do? So what would you be your next step? Of course, everybody will tell you, well, you use some chemical to open the barrier. Probably this is the chemical that you injected. So how you can really ask the question whether something in the blood, so what's implied for this, from this uh, approach is that something in the blood goes into the brain and induces these changes of the network. So instead of a normal network, now this network de become hyperconnected, if you want, and inducing all kinds of strange activity. So what will be your next step? How would you confirm that this is something in the blood? How can you breach the blood and barrier Like what? Like? A, a different type of liquid or, or something to see whether it's specifically blood or to see if it was like So what would you put? Okay. So you would like to put on the brain blood, right? Yeah. So instead of opening the barrier, you can put on the brain blood or serum proteins mm -hmm. and see if you get the same response. Right. To close the barrier is more difficult. Uh, I, we don't know how to do it. This is the problem. But to put on the brain blood, we can. And actually, the final um, story is that you can, it's enough, it's sufficient to put on the um, brain one protein. Actually, the most common protein in the blood is, anybody know? It's albumin. OK. And it's enough, it's sufficient to put a protein from the blood onto the brain and to get the same abnormal activity. So you get the seizures type of activity if you do this type of uh, experiment. And then, of course, you can start asking the question whether uh, what's happened to these proteins. So the experimental approach could be now to put into the ventricles of the mice, anesthetized mice, to put a pump that will perfuse serum proteins and serum albumin into the brain. And you can see that it goes into the brain. This yellow red color, this is concentrations of this albumin. And see what's happened to the same animal and, and where, where does it go? So one interesting uh, effect of this was that this protein went into specific cells, and these are astrocytes. Okay, and I will make a very long story short, but these are the same cells that are connecting between the blood vessels and the brain cells. Okay? And here you can use all kinds of genetic manipulations. You can mark these cells. Uh, I don't think we can... Uh, we have to go into it, but today you know that we can start marking cells in the brain with different uh, genes, so we can see specific type of cells. I mean, there are all kinds of fancy experiments that you can do. You can use genetic manipulations to induce animals that uh, express green, green fluorescent protein. So this, this mice actually carries a protein into specific cell populations and these cell populations are observed in the brain, and you can see that these exactly the same cell populations are taking up albumin from the blood, and you can really study specific cell populations and what's happened to them. 
and you can record from these animals, as you can see here. So these are the recording systems, so the animal is basically free to move. You implant the animal with recording system, with pumps, with uh, medication, with drugs if you want. You can do all kinds of neat things, and you can really see that these animals develop epileptic seizures. I will not uh, go into more details, just to say uh, that now what we uh, can see that you have, like in humans, you have a certain time, time window between the event, between the stroke, or between the opening of the barrier and the development of the, the, the secondary changes. And now you can start looking what's happening in this time period. And the techniques that people use to do this is by, for example, we can do gene arrays. So today we can just look at all the changes in gene expression that happens uh, in this time window and try to figure out what are the changes that are relevant uh, to this kind of changes following a blood and barrier opening. So this is how it looks. So basically what you can see here that all the changes in colors, this is up regulation of genes and down regulation or the other way around, up regulation of genes and down regulation of genes in different times after the treatment, and you can start, start dissecting what are the mechanisms, what's going on there during the time after uh, the pathology, the initial pathology to the secondary event. Uh, and perhaps the last message is, or the, before the last message is, that it turns out that, again, these glue cells that we once thought that they are only kind of glue to the cells, these glia cells, these astrocytes that are kind of connecting between cells are very, very important functionally and they interact with neurons from one hand to the vascular bed with another hand, so they really affect the function of nerve cells, they control the extracellular environment they induce immune response in the brain, so they can, you can induce immune um, immune response like you have a foreign, like these proteins are foreign, are foreigners to the brain and you induce immune response in the brain. Uh, and the last message is actually uh, that, or before the last, is that now that you, once you know the mechanism, and once you can think of the mechanism, you can start to play and prevent it, and think whether you can prevent it. Uh, if, once you know the mechanism, you can try to prevent the changes in gene expression and change the, reduce the seizure activity to block the epileptic activity, and to create kind of a scheme or hypothesis uh, that are trying to figure out how interactions between the different cells in the network are interacting each, with each other in time and space to induce brain damage. And the last message is that we can start now, we can start go back to patients, to our patients, and develop methods to measure this permeability changes, to measure blood and barrel permeability this doesn't exist, basically. We still, now we have new candidates. Now we can start looking at blood vessels in patient's brain, try to see whether there is this disruption, how much there is, whether it's relevant to cognitive deterioration, to epileptic seizure, and perhaps even to treat it. So uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. And if you have thoughts about it, I'll be... In humans? Yeah. So the best methods is probably, first, uh, is, first of all, is, is, is imaging. So with the although that would be the best methods that, well, there are three, in principle, there are three ways. First of all is look at the brain of patients to search for serum proteins. 
So the only way to do it is to tap, to take some uh, cerebral spinal fluid and measure albumin or another serum protein. This is pretty invasive, it's not very accurate and you don't know where it is, so this is a, a way, but it's not. The second way is to look in the blood for brain proteins. So if the blood mirror is open, you can say proteins from the brain will go into the blood, let's measure them. And people are doing that, but again, you don't have much. We don't have a good marker. And probably the best option is to do imaging. And the best imaging approach is MRI. And the way you do that is to inject contrast material that doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So here, what you can see here is that you have, a, this is a basically a, a marker for permeability. So if you look at the brain, you have a very low permeability. If you look outside the brain, you have high permeability. And you can see here around this lesion, this, uh, you have increased in permeability. This is, in this case, this is, these are patients with a traumatic brain injury. So surrounding, exactly like in the stroke, surrounding the trauma, you have a region, you have a penumbra with increased permeability. So this would be, uh, the, the main problem, the main difficulty still is in the literature is to quantify it and to, to follow the patient and to see whether these patients will develop problems. So we don't know that yet, but now we have at least uh, an approach to go over it and, and to see whether it's inducing a disease. So, so MRI will be the best way to do it. So that's the, the, that's the main, uh, well, that's, of course, that would be the main question. Uh, in order to do that, first of all, you have to understand what is really happening to them. And there is, a li there is actually much literature today, but there's not, the problem is that, and this is the problem that I didn't talk about, once you have, you can do gene arrays and you have 30,000 genes, so you have some thousands of genes that are changing. How do you know which one is the, hmm? So I, I mean, so now we can basically look at other sites, right? And we say once we do it in other sites, we have 200 genes that are changing. Which one is the critical one? Which one is important? So either we find a way to control all of them, or we have to find the critical one that are really affecting the function. So we have an idea, uh, and then the question, how do you affect Sites, and this is not yet clear. But at least there are directions. So there are not yet specific drugs to change associates. There are not yet specific drugs to affect associates, but there are still first ideas. So this, this, so associates only in the recent years be, became a target anyway. So neurons are not the only target. Hmm? Thank you very much.